there was a, a, a sweet shop across the street from the high school that I had graduated from. And there was a young lady who practically wrote the song uh, hollering to a guy that my boyfriend's back and you're going to be in trouble because you've been saying things about me. We wrote this narration. Uh, you, uh, and, you, uh, you went away and uh, he went away and you hung around and bothered me every night. And uh, when you wouldn't go out, when I wouldn't go out with you, you said things that weren't we're very, very nice. nice. He went away and you hung around and bothered me every night. And when I wouldn't go out with you, you said things that weren't very nice. Boyfriend's back and you're gonna be in trouble. Hey la de la, my boyfriend's back. See him come and better cut out on the double. Hey la de la, my boyfriend's back. You've been spreading lies that I was untrue. Hey la de la, my boyfriend's back. Look out now, cause he's coming after you. Hey la de la, my boyfriend's back. Hey, he knows what you've been trying. were making it big, so everybody became a girl group, and a writer wanted to write for the girl groups, and producers wanted to produce girl groups, and they were available. But one or two girl groups make it, and everybody jumps on the bandwagon, and then there are 24,000 girl groups, and a sound is created. The girl groups are in. I knew I was going to sing. I just had no, uh, no qualms, nothing about it. I knew I wanted to sing. And I wanted to sing rock and roll. I fell in love with the voice. And it was Frankie Lyman. Why do fools fall in love? Why do birds sing so gay? Frankie Lyman's voice to me was one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard in my life. And that's what I wanted to sing like, and that's what I wanted to sound like. He was my admiration. Love is a losing game, and love can be a shame. I know I'm a fool, you see. Oh, that fool is me, tell me why. Oh, 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 oh. Tell me why. At a certain point, Frankie Lyman's record of Why Do Fools Fall in Love? got popular. But when I heard it, and I heard that Frankie was only 13, and I think I was about 13 and a half, I said, wow, if he's doing that, we could certainly get on the radio, you know? Chantel started, I think, um, in the early 50s, when we were all members of the Cherub Choir at St. Anthony of Patterson School. Maybe came out, I said, I want to meet that lady. She has a voice on her. Maybe, 
tendency to lean to all the songs that had some kind of heartbreak or some kind of sadness and there was always a beauty in the sadness. Baby. I was singing about the kind of love that I didn't know. I loved my parents. Sitting on the bus, looking out of the window, uh, and thinking about what I had to do tomorrow was absolute bliss, because I would be in another city, and that evening I would be doing something that I absolutely loved to do. Dressing up and getting on stage and singing. It was very easy then. The times were very happy then. In those days, they said it very plain and simple. I would say very naive, very innocent, full of hope, full of fantasy, full of promise. There was a period of not only romanticism, of, of memories that were so vivid of hooks and riffs and sing-along type of uh, sounds. The key place in America or the world at the time was the Brill Building, and that was at 1619 Broadway. The Brill Building was the most live place you can imagine back then. There were music publishers and managers of musical acts on every floor. You would get off the elevator and you would hear pianos going, people singing. Frequently in the Brill Building, writers would go, as they used to say, to peddle their songs. Usually they'd try to get to the piano. Sometimes they would sing a cappella. Sometimes they had a ukulele. And sometimes they'd pull out a clarinet and play a tune and say, would you like this one? And they'd go from door to door trying start to sell it. And they'd start at the top because it's easier to walk down than to walk up. But looking at them just gives me the blues. We wrote the song, we took it to an artist, we rehearsed the artist, we'd pick an arranger. Mike would do a skeleton arrangement, we would go into the studio, the orchestrator would fill in the skeleton, we would record it, we would mix it, we would edit it, we would press it, we would put it out. Nobody cared about money. We were so happy just to be making records and like to be able to get paid the amount of money, whatever it was, to do something that you love. Just the thought of somebody paying me or paying us. Well, I think that's to, it. To do something that we would have done for nothing. The fact know. that you can make some sort of a living out of doing something you totally enjoy that just comes out of your head. Money was not the main thing. The most important thing was all these people were just loving us. The money just kept rolling in and the hits kept rolling in. And you walk away at 28 years of age with a $2 million check for you and your partner. It's very, very difficult to turn down. What happened to us was like the American dream. Everybody was working together. The writers were working with the producers, with the publishers, with the artists to make hits and to have a good time. Carole King wrote a song called Will You Love Me Tomorrow, which is probably one of my all-time favorite songs. Tonight you're mine, completely. We brought the songs to the Shirelles, which effectively started Scepter Records. I mean, it was a real major hit. And effectively, I began to feel that we had the power to create record companies as well. Because the key to me as a publisher was always the song. I guess if I had to pick who I really, really got off on the most, I'd say the Shirelles. 
the Shirelles while idle. I mean, those girls, well, they had hit after hit after hit. Carol King and Jerry Goffin had a babysitter by the name of Eva Boyd. She came in with a song that was a demo, and I took it home with me, and I said, this is absolutely incredible. I realized it wasn't even a question of greed. Why shouldn't I have my own record company? And I told Carol and Jerry that Jerry will be the producer of the record, and we'd put it out and we'd distribute it ourselves. It had the train sound, it had that cooking feel, and I figured it would be a new dance craze. started our own record company called Stork Records, and it had a stalk with a top hat on it, stork. and underneath said, delivers the hits. Redbird actually started because we needed a label to release records on. We had certain records, and there was no record company to release them, so we had to get them out. Redbird Records was run by people that really knew music, and it was an extension of the family situation. Everybody worked together to make the label happen. Ellie Greenwich, very talented, effervescent, happy-go-lucky Dane, very talented songwriter, who uh, fell in love with Jeff Barry and married him. And uh, they became one of the hottest writing teams at that time. I think one of the reasons I started going out with him was like, he was one of the first guys I ever dated where I could actually go to the piano and sing a note and I would hear a go harmony. It was like, wow. Love. Who couldn't love Chapel of Love? Innocent, everybody wants to be in love and get married. It's one of the few records that songs I wrote, and when the record was made, I knew it would be a number one record. happened with Jeff and I, I just think that we had too much happen to us too fast and I think the marriage suffered because the music did so well. We just got so wrapped up in the music, we didn't take enough time to get to know one another. The song in the background is one of my all-time favorites called Chapel of Love, for which they got this gold record. They followed it up with People Say, for which they got this gold record. And then they followed that up with a song they're about to sing for you right now. Let's welcome them in a big shindig way, the fantastic Dixie Cups.
Outsiders. You can hear for yourself one of the best groups, one of the best girl singers, Brenda. Strong, powerful, feeling, streak. Martha and the Vandellas were singing, or the Marvelettes, or the Supremes. Motown was getting down. In 1963, at the BMI dinner, a gentleman tapped me on the shoulder and shook my hand and said, Don, I want you to know I think you've done a tremendous job and your people are great. And I'm starting a little operation out of Detroit with some great writers and producers and record people. His name was Barry Gordy, and of course, he's legendary today. Barry Gordy, I would say, for us, he was, was like a genius. Oh, my God. As a matter 
much about music and uh, he was a songwriter and to work with him, it was like going to school it was like working with a professor someone who really knew what he was talking about if you were to sing a song he would say well that song's not for you or do it this way and it'll work and it normally worked we had charm classes and they brought in people who were the best in their field like choreographer Charlie Atkins who was just Fabulous. And Barry was on top of all that. to it as a Motown family, and that's really true. When I look back, I said, was it really that good? I would say that it really was that good. It really was a family. <laughs> 